All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Carson Lake Wildlife Management Area Conceptual Management Plan uh, presentation. Um, Want to welcome you all. Uh, sorry that this isn't in person. Um, this is something that we did to try to provide opportunity for people during these times of COVID, but also um, in the spirit of providing the recording so that future uh, people can watch it in the future to understand what was said here and also uh, give them the opportunity to see the same information at different times. So um, welcome. My name is Alan Janae. I'm the Habitat Division Administrator for Nevada Department of Wildlife. Um, this conceptual management plan process that we're kicking off here today is the process by which we go through to manage our wildlife uh, management areas for the Department of Wildlife. Um, we're just starting this process, so it's the very beginning. The presentation that we're going to go through here today is just a background and overview of the area um, and the values of wild, wildlife values on the property and, and some of the past management. And then we'll open up the opportunity for folks to give us uh, some thoughts on their, you know, comments or concerns or, you know, things that they would like to see included in the management plan as, as we continue this process. Um, we'll walk through this and uh, give everybody an idea. Um, as far as the, uh, like I say, the, the, the purpose of the meeting is, is to get the management plan out there and uh, make sure everybody has the same background as far as the wildlife management area. Uh, for your information, the meeting is being recorded and will be made available. Um, we really want to make sure that, you know, uh, everybody's putting their best foot forward and profanity or inappropriate behavior will not be tolerated in the chat or the question and answers. All questions in the chat box or question and answer box should be on topic. Um, should folks fail to follow these guidelines, we'll basically mute the individual in the chat and the question and answers and be removed from the live stream. So hopefully everybody's good with that. Um, we really wanna make sure that we hear from the public. We understand that this uh, transfer of Carson Lake and Pasture is something that's been in the works since 1990. So we're over 30 years in um, and just getting this thing transferred. And we know that the values that are on this property are all a result of a whole lot of partnerships and people that have maintained this property historically. And so um, we want to give everybody the opportunity to, to provide comment and kind of see themselves in the future management of this property. You can go ahead, Julie. The agenda that we have here today, we wanted to just walk through an opportunity. We'll give you an introduction to the panelists that are presenting from the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Um, the ground rules, uh, which I kind of laid out. We'll discuss the wildlife management area system and the purpose of the conceptual management plan the wildlife management area background and resource information, the existing and ongoing projects. We'll give you an overview of those, summary of the issues identified at past meetings, other issues and strategies to be addressed, provide an opportunity for a public input and a meeting wrap up. Um, as we go through this, wanna let you know that we kind of have, just in this format, we've kind of kind of manage how we receive questions and so, as we go through the resources at the back end of that, we'll open up an opportunity for the public to ask questions. You'll be able to raise your hand or put a question in the chat and Julia will monitor. Um, your opportunity to comment will be limited to three minutes. Uh, you get one opportunity in each of those windows. Also, as I said, is, is there is a, a email that's available for comments that you'll be able to uh, you know, submit to that email address to, to outline your comments uh, for the future consideration in the management plan. And with that, I think we'll just each take an opportunity to introduce ourselves. As I said, my name's Alan Janae, Habitat Division Administrator. Um, I don't know if each individual can 
turn off their video and show themselves. I don't know if that helps, but um, we don't mind taking a round robin. Maybe Julie, if you'd introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Julie Bless and I'm moderating this discussion. So if you have any technical difficulties, you can message me in the chat. Um, you have three ways to interact with us. We have the chat, the question and answer box, and when the determined times are, as Alan said, um, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Since you control the cameras, do you mind highlighting each of the next individuals, Julie? Sure. Uh, Mike Zaradka, you want to go next? Yes, thanks, Alan, and thanks, Julie, for filling in last minute. We had some technical issues today, but uh, thanks for getting us through this. I am Mike Zaradka. I am the Endow Habitat Division uh, WMA Staff Specialist. I'm in the Reno headquarters. So yeah, um, thanks everyone. I and mean, as we're going through the introductions today, I just wanna let you know that this Endow planning team is made up of various um, staff members from the different divisions uh, from the Department of Wildlife. The team is gonna help answer questions today and we're gonna work to get a draft uh, CMP plan out, which is gonna cover goals, objectives, and management strategies uh, that the department and what the public, you know, what their visions are today. So thanks again, everyone for joining us. Um, I kind of had a, a list here. It's just in alphabetical order with first names. So Isaac, do you mind going next? Sure. I'm Isaac Metcalf. Um, I'm the uh, Western Wetlands Complex Supervisor. So from our office, our office is in Mason Valley, but we uh, also manage uh, Alkali Lake, Fernley, Scripps, Humboldt, um, Mason Valley, and then now Parson Lake, WMAs. Thank you. Jacob Ward. Hey, I'm Jacob Ward. I am the technician out at Carson Lake Wildlife Management Area. Um, Isaac is my supervisor. And then I also help out up at Toulon and Humboldt as well. Thank you. Jenna. Hi, my name is Jenna Larkin. I'm the GIS data coordinator for the Department of Wildlife. And I manage all of our data, data systems, and any maps made. Thank you. Joe? Hi, uh, Joe Barnes. I'm the statewide staff specialist with the Wildlife Diversity Division. I'm located here in the Reno headquarters. Um, glad to join you today. Patrick. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I am Pat Kelly. Um, I am the staff specialist located here in the Reno headquarters, and I oversee the fish hatcheries for the state. Uh, I'm in a little different capacity than I was back in 2009 when I and Elmer Bull headed this thing up initially. Um, so I'm back at it and uh, ready to hear some, some questions and I hope we can give you some really good responses. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Pat. Russell. Hello everybody, Russell Wolstenhume. I'm here in the headquarters in Reno. I'm the waterfowl staff specialist. So um, hopefully we can get some good input from everyone today and um, move forward with the CMP in a, in a quick timeline and, and get ourselves operational out there. Very good, thanks Russell. Yeah, I uh, hope I didn't miss anybody on the planning team. You got miss me? Jake, yeah. Oh yeah, there he is, Jake. Hey everybody, I'm Jake Kramer. I'm a game warden captain uh, headquarters uh, office and I oversee general wildlife law enforcement operations. Okay, with that, yeah, we've got everyone. Thank you, Jake. So we can move to the next slide, please. So this slide shows a map of all the wildlife management areas across the state. Uh, these are the properties that the state owns or manages under long-term lease agreements for their wildlife habitats and public recreation values. Um, those values, we have hunting, we've got fishing, wildlife viewing across all of these properties. So with the addition of Carson Lake and Pasture to the WMA system, that'll put us up to 12 properties and over 150,000 acres um, across the state. 
So being able to add a WMA, it's a major accomplishment and undertaking for the department. It doesn't happen very often. In fact, the last time we added a WMA to this uh, to our system was back in 1999 when uh, the state bought the Free Sea Ranch south of Ely. Um, two Nevada Board of Wildlife Commissioners policies provide direction for the department regarding WMAs. Policy 65 provides designation of properties into the WMA system. And policy 66 provides guidance for the management and use of those properties. Primary objectives for wildlife management areas typically fall into wetland protection uh, and, public, uh, and public recreation, um, hunting, fishing, like I had mentioned. So given Carson Lake's value to, to waterfowl and shorebirds and its wetland, um, we would expect it's gonna be managed mostly for its wetland habitat benefits with other uses encouraged on the area as well. Other state and federal regulations also come into play with the management of these areas. Um, at this time, no federally listed species are known to occupy the Carson Lake WMA. Um, the Clean Water Act um, establishes the basic structure for regulating discharges of pollutants and regulating quality standards to surface waters. So that's something we'll have to be cognizant of. Um, and also, you know, cultural resources. Prior to the transfer, uh, Endow has worked with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, State Historic Preservation Office, Division of State Lands, Paiute Shoshone Tribe, the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe, and the Churchill County Sheriff's Office to develop a cultural resource management plan for this area. So um, with that, we can go to the next slide, please. So why are we creating this conceptual management plan for Carson Lake? Uh, the management plan uh, being developed will be broken into two parts. Part one provides the history and background information of the area along with current resource values. Much of this is what we're gonna be covering today and going over here on this afternoon. Part two uh, will be developed after this meeting. This is gonna include the goals, objectives, and management strategies that we will use um, to achieve the department's and the public's vision for this area. Uh, the plan will assist with development of any regulations that will need to be added to the area. Um, stuff like this might include hunting, boating regulations, firearm discharge restrictions, camping and vehicular travel, um, which is something that we deal with on all of our wildlife management areas. Uh, we want to meet the increasing public demands on the area while still protecting and enhancing the wildlife resources of the area with minimal conflicts. Uh, another major goal of this is to help us um, build a budget for this area and for future management and development activities of the area. Um, simple stuff that we can handle on an annual basis through federal grants is stuff like um, road improvements, fixing fences, um, stuff like that. Those are covered annually under sport fish and wildlife restoration grants. Um, uh, the, if we were looking at maybe increasing staff, um, buying heavy equipment, uh, that stuff's a little bit more difficult when we need to go through legislative approval. So we need to budget out a couple of years to look at stuff like that. And uh, another component we'll probably be looking at too is construction of facilities out at Carson Lake and Pasture. Um, if we're looking at an office or a visitor center, um, things of that nature, we're going to have to develop plans with our engineering section and probably work with state public works as well as uh, other agencies to get that stuff um, constructed on the properties. Um, yeah, so next slide, please. So uh, just a brief background of the Carson Lake um, and pasture. So it's located about eight miles south of Fallon. Um, Carson Lake was historically um, one of the terminuses of the Carson River. The Carson Lake and Pasture dates back to the early 1900s when the Newlands Project was started um, under the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation to provide um, irrigation water um, for crops in the Fallon and Fernley areas. Lahontan Dam was finished in 1915. Uh, the river channel was then modified to redu reduce urban flood impacts. And by 1930, only irrigation waste and drain water reached this area. Um, Greenhead Hunting Club, Nevada's oldest organized hunting group, um, has held a hunting lease on this property prior to the 1920s. 
The Truckee Carson Irrigation District has managed grazing on this area as a community pasture since about that same time. Uh, back in 1990, the Secretary of the Interior authorized Public Law 101-618, 618, excuse me, which uh, transferred the property, um, set to transfer the property from the from the federal ownership to the state. Um, the delay, I mean, that was well over 30 years ago. So um, delay due to various issues such as you know water rights, um, cultural resource concerns, like I had touched on. And um, more recently, by boundary adjustments um, on this property. Uh, in April of this year, approximately 23,130 acres were transferred from reclamation and BLM to the state. Um, with that comes an additional 7,000 acres, mostly on the south and east ends, uh, which will be managed um, by Endow as part of the WMA um, under an agreement with Bureau of Reclamation. So with that, I'll pass it over to Russell. Um, he's got some waterfowl and hunting information. So next slide, please. Thank you. So I'm going to take a very broad look at waterfowl that occurs on Carson Lake. And what I have here is a couple of different uh, items that show over the last, this is a a five-year time frame, and then just so the, the recent past by month that shows waterfowl surveys that have occurred at Carson Lake. I, I want to um, provide credit for this information to uh, NWA and Norm Sakey who conducts those surveys. So this just gives you a rough idea of the major waterfowl species that, that occur out at Carson Lake. Um, the table on the right kind of shows when they peak, but their migrations are coming through during that time of year. So there's certainly other waterfowl species that occur out there. This isn't meant to be an exhaustive list. This is just the ones that are, are most common and the ones that we see mostly during um, survey out there. So you see there's a fair number of birds that occur out there and those numbers vary month to month depending on weather conditions and water conditions out there. So next slide, please. On this slide, this shows again the recent past, the last five years of, of waterfowl harvest coming off of Carson Lake. Um, this data is courtesy of the Greenhead Club. They're the ones that have collected this the last five years. So, you know, there's varying things that impact waterfowl harvest out there. 2017, 18 was the flood year. And um, that, that had a definite impact on access to the area. And so there was an impact uh, to hunting pressure and what could be hunted out there. You'll also notice there's a, a big spike in both hunt days and harvest during the 2020, 2021 hunt year. And that's a social impact from the COVID year when there were people had seemingly more time on their hands and more people getting outside. So you know, habitat conditions and social conditions alike impact waterfowl harvest. There's just an overview of, of um, what we were seeing out there for, for hunting. Next slide, please. So I, this is a, a table that shows for the past five years, banding efforts out of Carson Lake. Carson Lake isn't always one of our focuses. Um, there has been banding out there, again, uh, this is impacted by a lot of different factors. You'll see 2017, 2018, there was a, a decent amount of mallards and, and only mallards that were banded out there. The following year, you'll notice that the effort dropped and there were only six mallards, but there were 144 other ducks. And this is a result of a botulism outbreak out there. We were rehabbing birds. So a lot of different ducks were being banded that year. You also notice in the last column, there's goose releases out there. Those are those are birds that are that are collected during the the Truckee Meadows goose roundup. Remove those geese from airstrike zones in the Truckee Meadows, and then they're relocated throughout the state. And some of those birds do make it out to Carson Lake. You'll see that uh, the most recent year, there was a pretty large number taken out there to Carson Lake. So. 
just gives you an idea of the banding efforts out there. I would anticipate as this goes forward, the this process, there'll be more and more banding that takes place out of Carson Lake. That's that's the hope and and provide more data to us through that endeavor. Next slide, please. And then finally, I just wanted to kind of mention coming from the game division that there's a lot of other wildlife species that occur out at Carson Lake. Um, I know that traditionally there's been a lot of just waterfowl hunting, but there's a lot of other species that will be likely available to hunt on that on that area. Um, there are various restrictions and rules that apply to those. And, and I'm sure that Jake Kramer from law enforcement will delve into that a little deeper, but just wanted to put it in your minds that other species exist that are available for recreation out there. So that's that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Um, you can hear me. Uh, my in my introduction, I mentioned I'm the statewide staff specialist for the Wildlife Diversity Division. Um, we cover, we're the counterpart for our game division. Um, and so our, the program really covers everything non-game. Um, and terrestrial, but what I want to focus today on are, are some of our avian species that are found out in uh, Carson Lake and pasture. Um, and, and start off with the list of species of conservation priority that we have identified. Um, and that doesn't necessarily indicate rarity of these species or general threat levels, but it's those are there, it's a list of species identified in our 2012 State Wildlife Action Plan um, that basically highlights and prioritizes those species for um, our work to ensure conservation, broad scale conservation and, uh, and monitoring efforts and whatnot. So um, just to kind of show you what we have out there, some of the, the diversity um, in the shorebirds and waterbird category. Um, again, this is just focusing on non game species. Uh, we've got a lot of shorebirds, things like American avocets, uh, bitterns, um, some marsh birds, as well as terns and gulls. Um, and then with raptors, um, they aren't necessarily a focus of a lot of our survey work, but they do heavily impact the species assemblages out there. Um, and so you'll note that we've, uh, you know, regularly or semi regularly detect bald eagles, golden eagles, Virginus hawks, peregrine falcons, prairie falcons, shorty owls, and western burrowing owls. Next slide. So, um, from the non game or shore, shorebird perspective, um, I do want to note that um, the Western Hemispheric uh, or Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network has designated the, um, the Lahontan Valley Wetlands Complex as a hemispheric, a, a site of hemispheric importance back in 1988. Um, and that Lahontan Valley Wetlands Complex includes um, Carson Lake and pasture, but it also includes areas like the Stillwater National Wildlife Refuge and Fallon, um, Paiute Shoshone Tribal Wetlands. Um, and so just to kind of indicate a little bit more what that means, the hemispheric importance designation at the time that, that it was given to um, Lahontan Valley, um, it was defined as having at least 250,000 shorebirds on an annual basis and or at least 10% of, of a population, a biogeographical population segment of any given species of shorebird. Um, that, that designation has increased since then up to a half a million birds annually or at least 30% um, of the biogeographic population for any specific species. Um, but still, the, the original um, designation still stands for um, Lahontan Valley Wetlands. I want to note that the Pacific Americas uh, Shorebird Conservation Strategy has actually highlighted and indicated that the Lahontan Valley Wetlands is one of the most important inland sites for shorebirds in North America, um, particularly Western North America. But when you look at the interior west, it stands very, very high as far as overall diversity and numbers of birds that use the area. Um, also, the um, I, as Mike I believe indicated earlier, the 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 congressional designation that that basically allowed for the transfer of of Carson uh, Lake and pasture from from federal ownership and management over to state ownership and management that was back in 1990. 
it's indicated that um, the management upon transfer would be consistent with Wishern. That's the, the again, the Western Hemisphere uh, Shorebird Reserve Network um, designation. Next slide, please. So um, now what I'd like to highlight is just some of our, our survey work. Um, it's pretty extensive. It's a very long-term data set. Um, it's ongoing, but what I'm going to show you here, uh, these numbers are just from the period of 1986 through 2019. Um, notable, uh, it was over 1.7 million birds, uh, shorebirds and aquatic birds combined. Um, so rather large use there. Those surveys are conducted twice a year during peak migration periods in spring and fall. Um, the surveys themselves are conducted by ground surveys and also airboat uh, using airboat access to uh, count birds from the water. Um, I do also want to note that there, we certainly have breeding uh, in the Carson Lake and pasture area of, of some of these species, but by, by and large, uh, the vast majority of shorebird species are actually going northward and um, basically hit this area in transit. So they're breeding up in the Arctic and boreal regions. Um, and so just a quick breakdown. Again, this is over a 34-year period. Each survey period wasn't necessarily surveyed every single year based on various reasons. Um, uh, oftentimes it was logistical or weather uh, issues that were encountered. Um, but the spring survey period, uh, those surveys generally occurred in April and May. Um, so 30 of those 34 years were surveyed um, with an overall average of 34,320 birds per, per year or per season in that spring season. Uh, is broke, broken down by 28 different species of shorebirds and 26 species of aquatic birds. And aquatic birds, that includes things like the marsh birds, but also gulls and terns and pelicans and things, diving uh, species as well as like grebes, uh, various species of grebes. In the fall, the corresponding breakdown is after 32 years of survey, a um, little bit lower, but about 22,000, almost 23,000 birds per, um, per fall uh, survey effort. Um, the overall, just to give you an idea of the overall diversity of species out there, we've got um, cumulative uh, at this point, 30 different species of shorebirds. Again, that's the, the vast majority of birds that we've counted over the years at 1.7 million individuals. Water birds, um, nearly 42,000. Um, and then raptors, eight species with only 40 individuals and other birds that are noted out there, various songbirds and pasterns and whatnot. Next slide, please. And so again, just to show you how that breaks down, there's uh, you know 1.7 million birds is an awful lot of birds. Um, however, about 88% of that is made up of a total of three species or three species complexes. Um, and so what you see here in this um, this pie graph is the 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 nine most predominant species that were counted as as well as all others. These 43 species that are kind of captured in the 5% portion of the pie. Um, so we've lumped the long and short-billed dowagers just because there's, it, most of them are long-billed dowagers, but there is some difficulty in ID, identifying them at a distance. So 35% of the overall um, breakdown is long or short-billed dowagers, followed by American avocets, and then the um, lumped uh, Western and least sandpipers. Um, and then you can see the other species break down, black neck stilts, Wilson Fowler, and so forth. Um, just a quick note, uh, the font colors here, this is, um, that's an indication of, um, uh, sorry, um, the U.S. Shorebird Conservation um, uh, uh, level uh, threat, threat assessment, um, apologize. Um, so anyways, in long, in, in red, you see the long-billed curlew. These, in, this is a, a threatened species. Um, mo moderate level of threat um, is indicated here in blue font, and then the black font is, are species with low, uh, exist, uh, low threat. So with that, that's my portion. Next slide. All right, uh, I'm basically here to go over the little fisheries um, portion of it. Um, again, the fisheries potential for Carson Lake pasture is fairly limited. Um, that's pretty obvious. Um, there are ditches and some units that will hold water and they will carry over in some years, particularly during wet, wet seasons. 
Um, but uh, when we find places, well, ourselves in the type of dry conditions that we see ourselves this year, um, more than likely not. Um, during the substantial wet years, we do see an opportunity possibly of planting bass and probably catfish into some of those ditches and units um, that could potentially carry over. But again, it's, um, it's limited. Um, and again, general fishing regs will be uh, enforced for the Western region. Um, and I'm sure Jake probably will have some more um, information regarding that. Um, but again, fisheries are, are somewhat limited. Next slide, please. Okay, well, that takes it to, uh, to me. I, again, uh, Jake Kramer, uh, I represent the law enforcement division. Uh, this, this portion is, is pretty simple. It's the do's and don'ts. Um, you can or you can't on a, on a wildlife management area. And some, uh, for the most part, wildlife management areas have the same general rules. However, there's uh, specifics uh, in certain cases to where we uh, either give more leeway or restrict um, in certain things to a specific wildlife management area. So uh, part of this discussion obviously is to, uh, to talk about what the rules are and what they could possibly be for uh, Carson Lake pasture. This slide that you see in front of you right now is uh, general regulations for all WMAs. And this is just a reference list. Um, if you wanted to look it up on your own, um, simply put this in, in front of you so you can uh, have a better reference to get to it even faster. Next slide. All right, this, uh, by the way, all these slides, except for the previous one, um, can be found in your small game guide, the general endow small game guide, which you see in any store, Walmart or any, uh, anywhere. We also have it on our, on our endow webpage as well. So this, uh, the slide here gives you the a rundown at a glance of season restrictions uh, for all the different WMAs that we have currently. So for example, uh, is it open this time of year? Is it, is it closed certain uh, days of the year, certain days of the month or the week? Uh, we also have use of vessels uh, as far as are there vessels allowed? And, and also certain areas, so certain pond restrictions um, are on, on certain WMAs. Uh, wake, viola, uh, wake zone or speed restrictions would be another one, um, as well as even uh, motor uh, restrictions. Are they limited to uh, no motors on vessels or maybe, uh, like I said, I don't, I don't believe any, anything we have right now allows uh, above a wake speed, which is a five mile an hour speed limit, essentially. We also have uh, use of campfires and camping uh, for the different WMAs in the area. And uh, generally that, that goes along with campfires are generally allowed where there's improved campgrounds on the premise. Um, and that's about it. So that'll, that'll probably be something that we'll need to determine for uh, Carson Lake. Next slide. Uh, again, these can be found in your books. Um, and these are the general uh, regulations again of uh, a little bit more in detail though, as far as what is open at what certain times um, of the year, what days of the week, uh, you know, scripts, for example, used to be open certain days. Now it's a seven day a week. So you're going to find that information right here. And we would then add that uh, Carson Lake and past your uh, management area to these publications as well. Next. Yeah, that's uh, basically continuing on. Uh, next slide. All right. So in general terms, um, we do have, uh, for, for good reason, restrictions on use of firearms and ammunition types within the WMAs. In general, we don't allow uh, the uh, rifles and pistols to be used on any WMA just for safety uh, reasons. But um, in certain areas, we will allow uh, deer hunting, for example, or big game hunting with the use of shotgun with slugs out of either a rifled barrel or a partially rifled barrel or even smooth bore with a uh, rifled slug. So that is an option uh, going forward on this property. Uh, but again, um, general restrictions, um, I, don't, I don't see that moving away uh, for this particular area. It's just a safety thing, not having 
you know, 300 wind mags or, uh, you know, nine millimeter shooting going on. Uh, we're not trying to create a shooting park. Um, restrictions in certain areas. This again is going to be um, uh, closures uh, during certain times or certain areas within the management area, certain times a year, um, you know, for nesting purposes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, construction, use of, use of decoys and blinds, um, all that is, is basic language. Um, again, for all WMAs, uh, decoys have to be picked up at 9 p.m. and uh, can't, uh, from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. Uh, can't be out on the landscape. Um, and then, of course, vehicular travel. That's a standard wildlife management area uh, verbiage in there that applies to all of them so far. And that would be to restrict access uh, to off-road travel within the the WMA uh, to prohibit damage to the, uh, the habitat. Um, and then the rest of it is just basic, uh, you know, rules and regulations according to, you know, uh, littering and, and things like that. So overall, we're looking at about, we, we have all these regulations. There's not all that many, honestly, but uh, some are very broad based and some are very specific to uh, certain WMAs. And uh, again, we're here to talk about how we'd like to, that to look for uh, Carson Lake Capacitor. Next slide. So I wanna be going over some of our um, past, current and ongoing projects that we've had going on at Carson Lake. Um, and starting off, I would say first and foremost has been our water rights. With the help of many partners over the past 30 plus years, we've been able to um, purchase and acquire over 7,000 acre feet of prime water for water deliveries to Carson Lake. Um, those water, that water is used for the marsh and put out to improve bird habitat and everything like that. Um, also some more projects that some partners have helped out with is our cabin drain project. Um, roughly 8,900 linear feet of accumulated sediment was removed in that project. Um, and one new water control structure was also included in that project to help us with water delivery. And then our rice drain project as well. Um, that was another improvement project where 15,200 um, feet of linear or linear feet of accumulated sediment was moved, removed in that project. Um, we replaced three existing water control structures and one culvert as well. And both of those projects help us with our overall water delivery. They help improve. Um, the movement of water and it makes life a little bit easier for, for me. <laughs> and so since I filled the position, more, some of our more recent projects have been really trying to hammer down and improve and repair the roads as well as treat weeds. Um, we treated 150 acres of white top this year and some tamarisk as well. Uh, those projects will be ongoing projects for years to come. Um, every single year we'll be fixing roads and spraying weeds and that's what they do at a lot of the management areas across the state. And then more recently in the last couple of months, I went through and pressure washed off all the bird towers, just try to kind of clean them up and make them a little bit nicer. Um, we're removing some dirt and feces and some trash from around them and just trying to make them better overall. Uh, we also went around and repainted some of the old signs, um, just trying to clean them up a little bit as well. And we included some new signage um, you, when you drive into the area, there's now a welcome to Carson Lake wildlife management area sign, um, and directly to the east of it, to the left of it, there's an information kiosk as well. And in that information kiosk, you'll find some general hunting regulations and general wildlife management area information, um, within that information kiosk. And then also in that kiosk, there is a map. We as a department got together with our GIS team and created a map for the area for the public to see and use. Um, you're more than welcome to snap a picture of it if that makes life easier for you, or you can stop by the Fallon Endow office and we have some printed out that you can pick up and, and keep it for yourself. And another project we did was we put in two survey boxes. Um, when you first drive in, you'll see them on either direction. If you head south or east, you will see both the survey boxes. And with those, when you're leaving the area, we ask that you grab a card and on the front of it is your harvest information. And on the back side of it is a comment section. So if you feel that you have any comments that you'd like to voice, you're more than welcome to drop that in the survey box for me and I'll grab it. Um, 
I'll read it. And if any of these guys on the meeting or if anybody needs to be addressed, anything needs to be addressed, we can take care of it from there. Um, so that's another way to voice your comments as well. Um, and then most recently we put restrooms out. So there's four new porta potties out there. When you enter the area, um, right over the cattle guard, there's one. At the two west bird towers, there's one at each of those. And then on the north end of the property, as you're heading around toward the east side, um, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback already about the about the restrooms, and so we're glad that we can make an impact with that already. Um, in terms of our completed and ongoing projects, that's that's all I have. So, next slide, thanks, guys. Okay, so um, coming up on on the projects that we can do some of this stuff, we'll, we'll come out of the um, this management plan that we're working on. Um, some of the stuff we can actually get right onto it. Most of it will be uh, a lot of uh, improving uh, water control structures and uh, installing new culverts. Uh, moving waters is going to be key out there. Um, anyway, so the biggest thing I think we've been looking at is developing the, the wildlife fence and putting that back in as we can go when the, when we get a chance while the ponds are dry. Um, working with DU this right now, currently at the L8 uh, delivery, <clears throat> we'll get that done. That'll increase uh, our efficiencies and be able to get steady flow instead of um, big fluxes and dry periods as we ordered the water. Um, we moved a lot of gravel, get ready. We've got to get that put down, but we've got it stacked up and ready to um, build some roads. Um, the, so don't, the pond developments within the existing units, this might come about from our management plan and the scoping meeting. Um, let's see, and boating regulations, that'll come out of this meeting is what, what the users want. Camping, that's really, that's really early too. And uh, the diagonal drain, we started talking about that. That would be a good project to get uh, more water for the year round. Um, that would increase the shorebirds and waterfowl in the fall habitat. Next slide, I think that's all I got. Yeah, no, thanks, Isaac. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's pause here for a second to, to see if there's any questions regarding the informational content or I guess maybe back to Alan, if there was anything maybe we didn't cover um, that you wanted to hear or, or we could just go into, into some questions. Yeah, I think we would like to open this up and make the opportunity available. You know, if, if there was any particular questions relative to the, the resources on the area or the regulations that Jake Kramer gave an overview of, we can provide clarifications um, relative to this content and then We'll easily transition. We've got a couple more slides and then we'll transition into comments and consideration into the future management plan and, and you know, public's comment towards that. But I think at this time, we really wanted to kind of keep these questions focused on the resource uh, descriptions or historical content that we just provided, provide clarification there. See if there's any questions. Yeah. Julie was there. Um, any questions come in or does anybody have their hand up? I can't see. Yes, both. Um, we have a question in the Q&A. We have two questions in the chat box and then we have someone with their hand up. So where would you like to start? Let's start with the one with the hand up. Okay. The visual and then we'll go to the chats. All right. So this is Bob and um, he is going to be allowed to talk. Hey, Alan, this is Bob Standard from the Greenhead Club. How are you? Good, good. How are you, Bob? Oh, good, good. Just a, a few questions. Um, one, uh, recently we've had some ATVs out on the property, and we've never allowed ATVs out there before. And I was just wondering what the state's stance is going to be on that in the future. Yeah, and I, I think we can 
identify that as an issue, you know, as, as Jake Kramer gave an overview, um, that's something that we could look at, you know, designating, you know, or prohibiting through the regulation process. And that would be something we identify through this management plan and then take to, you know, appropriate place, uh, either through commission regulation or uh, through NAC to, to address that, to provide that exception. You know, yeah, I mean, let's face it, ATBs just tear up the roads and there's not that great of access out there anyway. So, great. Um, the well, other Bob, if I can uh, chime in here a little bit, uh, go right ahead. So, on, on WMAs, we generally have, uh, of course, the restrictions to only on the roadways. You can't go off road uh, and, and blaze your own trail, but we also have uh, speed limits within the WMAs. So, that's there designed to help uh, with the you know catter bumps and, and things like that as well. So um, all that stuff, if, if we end up doing allowing uh, ATVs to, to go through the property, which uh, a lot of places we do, um, it'll be restricted, I'm sure, to uh, uh, you know general uh, you know, traffic laws and stuff like that, that that apply to other WMAs. Okay, yeah, thanks, Jay. Jay. Um, yeah, and if I might, if it's okay, if I could add something to that too, yeah. On other wildlife management areas, um, we have designated roads, um, which we allow um, vehicular travel. So ATVs are allowed at many of the other WMAs, but they are restricted to those designated roads. They can go around gates, they can go through gates, um, and they can go off road like that has been brought up too. So um, yeah, just thoughts on what other wildlife areas um, allow as well. No, I, and I get that, Mike. Um, my my big concern is, I mean, vehicles rip up the roads bad enough, let alone ATVs trying to go around a pothole or or something. Um, granted, again, this is just you know, 120 years of managing the area, so yep. um, I appreciate everybody's input on that. Uh, the the next question I had was on closure times. Um, and, and I know, uh, Alan, you and I have discussed this about, you know, the area being open 24 seven. Um, I actually went out last week and picked up a whole, uh, car trailer full of trash that was left on the club. Uh, everything from boats to old decoys to to everything and, and my concern is just um again with the fallon area and the amount of traffic that we're going to have out there 24 7 so no, i appreciate that concern and i think that's something as we go through this process um I, and i'll open this up to mike as well but um you know, that's something that can be considered within this plan is this, you know, make sure that people have that opportunity for input, but hopefully with uh, getting this designated and Jake being on the property and hopefully additional assistance to come to, you know, bear um, in staffing at this location, hopefully we can also get a better grasp on it as well. Right. And, and you know, the, the public is another, another big one that I, I really appreciate anybody picking up anything they see and, and hauling out of there. Yeah, no, um, and thank you. Thank you for picking that up. Um, next question on, and I know this is a hard one. It's going to have to go through legislation, but is pasture permits. Um, uh, I know this year we're, we're going forward with the legislation to uh, do permits. Um, I'd just like to bring it to everybody's attention. The average for the past 10 years uh, with charging permits would bring uh, approximately $18,000 to Endow uh, for the management of the area. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, that, we, we, we figured that that would be a topic and it was a topic back in 2009 and in uh, you know that resulted in the NRS being created to to require the charging of a, a permit out there, and we expect that this will be a, another uh, you know topic that'll be discussed throughout this process. 
right right i i just wanted to have the, all the members aware you know the monetary benefit of charging a no. a, a fee so you bet. uh my only other concern at this time is camping in the area um there's no <clears throat> areas that would be allowed to camping uh as we see it in the past and uh i hope uh in the future that the state would agree with that and you know there's enough local areas in the fallon area to uh allow camping so okay thank you thanks for your comments bob all right we've got um brad who is going to talk as well Now. Hello, Brad. Hear you. Can you hear me all right? You're kind of light, but we can hear you. Oh, mayday. Hold on. How about now? About the same. Hey, well, listen, if you can hear me fine, um, uh, Bob brought up some good points. Never met Bob. I'm sure he's very knowledgeable being part of the Greenhead thing. Been out there several years myself. But I'm <laughs> <laughs> That's my bird dog barking at my wife. Um, I'm one of your ATV guys. Um, for some reason, we seem to have a, a, not a popular attitude towards the ATV folks. And I, I would like to change that and debunk what Bob was saying. Um, I take my ATV out there this year, and I've actually met Isaac and Jake out there. I don't know if you guys remember me. I'm the one that you waved down. Yeah. And I had my GPS out and I was just mapping out your whole new uh, WMA, which I'm very impressed with. And the, I like the idea that the state took it over. Um, my ATV uh, on the trails out there, the only potholes I go around are the ones probably made from my F-350 in the mud. Uh, ATVs are very gentle on your established roads out there. But that's that's not why I'm here today. The um, What I like, as you guys know, the uh, water level is extremely low and access is becoming a huge factor uh, for the duck hunters. I'm one of your duck hunters. And I'm also retired Navy. I'm 70% uh, rated disabled. So on your map here, when I hike out from your towers, oh, Brady, get free. Don't chuck her up there. <laughs> I hike out from uh, one of your towers. It's two and a half miles. I've got your nice map here that Mike sent to me. Mike, uh, we just spoke on the phone. So when I hike out on the Madsen levee, that's two and a half miles. And by the time I go a mile and a quarter out there to get to the big water, uh, I'm, I'm done. I can't wait out where the ducks are. And there's no sitting on the levee out there. Uh, I've tried it on the Miller Highway and you go down to the Lot Freeway. Are you familiar with that, with your map? Uh, that's where I actually came in last week when Isaac saw me. I got to that gate on the Lot Freeway and you can see where all the vehicles had gone around. I thought, well, all right, so I'll, I'll be one of those guys. And I was gonna cross all the way across there. And from there, then I could, it's not all about me, but it, it's about trying to get access out to where the ducks are. And from there, I could stop and actually wait out and get a hunt in. So I'm trying to impress upon you that maybe some element of uh, allowing access around those gates for your handicapped. I'm not a handicapped guy. I don't have a handicapped parking sticker. Uh, I do have issues from the Navy. I tried to discuss that with you over here one time. But for guys like myself that we can't hike the mile and a half and <laughs> try to wait out in that mud, and it just isn't going to happen. So if there's some element of being able to go around the gate, a transporter, my ATV works wonderful. I don't know why we don't like them. The levee trails are established. And you guys all know once it rains, it becomes mud. Uh, the vehicles do a lot more damage. I know my truck has and certainly my ATV. 
So that's my pitch for that. Find me a way to get out there so I can enjoy your dope, your awesome uh, wildlife management area. Okay, thank you, Brad. Thank you for your comments. Yeah, and I was just gonna, thanks Brad for that. This is Mike. So yeah, I, a lot of the other WMAs we do provide you know, disabled hunter access that we've got set aside blind to some of these areas too. So those are all good ideas. Yeah, and I think stuff that we'll make note of that and look into it. But I guess for this part of the questions here, we were just trying to you know stick on the, the resource and the history of it. And then a lot of the, the stuff we're talking here is what we wanna hear at the end as far as comments and future management. So. Because um, we still do have a few more slides to get through, and we're actually starting to talk about some of the points that I had on these slides. So um, I guess with that, we can see what other questions are still out there. Okay, so uh, one question is, who handles water delivery amounts and areas? Mike, you want to take that? Sure, yeah, I sure can. Um, so the Department of Wildlife, we as Jake mentioned earlier, own about 7,200 acre feet of prime water. So we have an internal uh, team. A lot of the people on this planning team here from Endow were part of that group. And annually we set, you know, um, we, we figure out which management area, um, which units we wanna put water in, into and when. Um, all of that runs through the Truckee Carson Irrigation District. So when we put in water orders, we work through them and. Um, don't really want to get into that whole process, but they're on a percent allocation. So on dry years, our 70% can be, or 70% was what we had this year. So it's all based on the, the current conditions on how much water we get, but there's an internal team that, that decides a lot of that stuff. Hope that answered the question. Is a fee possible for all Nevada WMAs? Hunters have always paid their way. It takes money to fund projects. I would like to see a statewide fee for hunting and fishing on WMAs. So I'll take a stab at that as is. Um, just recently, Endow went through a license simplification process. And if you remember um, at that time, there was a lot of stamps and a lot of uh, fees that, that, you know, people had to make sure that they acquired before they, you know, went after that particular pursuit. And, and as we went through that fee simplification, see fee simplification, what we did is we rolled those into the, the license costs. And so now when an individual buys their licenses, all of that is included. Um, and so that gives the opportunity where, you know, an individual who is new to the, the sport, um, you know, and trying to participate, um, they don't have to worry about uh, compliance with those uh, particular stamps or permits. And so it, what we've gone through recently in trying to simplify, um, you know, adding a, a WMA fee is kind of contrary to that movement. Um, we wanna try to remove barriers to participation and, uh, you know, that, that's kind of where we see that uh, in, in a WMA fee across all properties. Um, this was something that, you know, the group took a, a stance on at the time to develop this NRS to require the charging of a fee at Carson Lake and Pasture. But um, as far as to take that across all of the WMAs, um, that would probably be going contrary to where we've been moving with trying to remove, you know, obstructions to participation. Can you confirm that the drain flows are go are now going to Stillwater instead of Carson Lake? Jake? Um, yeah, I'll let Jake yeah. or Ike, but I, yeah, as far as this year, I, I would assume we got our share of drain oh. flow like most years. So, uh, on the drain flows now we get we're still getting some once they did the big did dig uh they'd split off some more down towards still water uh the way they were traditionally doing it it was backing up on some farmlands so they were once the big dig happened they were able to divert more over <clears throat> back to the north so we lost a little bit that way we still got some that's what the grazers use all year 
and uh, how, that's how they irrigate for the cattle. So I thought I saw another question here that we can answer that right now about, does our water fill up all the ponds? Um, I don't think so, not without the drain flows that can come in the summer. Without the drain flows, I think it takes all, it takes too much to rehydrate to get our ponds all full, even at 100% year. So they're very important for our area to continue drain flows. And that's all um, for TCID, they do it to the best, what works for them the best. So hopefully that helps. There's two more questions. One says, in prior years, we have been able to drive down dry dikes and across dry unit areas to gain closer access to hunting areas. Will this be allowed? I think this goes back to the answer that was provided, you know, by Jake Kramer and by Mike Zorotka as far as management of access. Um, so I think that that would uh, suffice for, for that question. Unless, Mike, you have any other additional thoughts you'd like to provide? Well, I think the end goal with all this is we're going to have a map that's going to show designated roads. Um, it may change during the year. Maybe springtime, some would be open. And then as we get closer to hunting season, maybe we would restrict some of the access. But yeah, I think it all depends on the particular area this person's talking about and what road exactly. And yeah, driving out through dry units, I, yeah, I, I can't envision that we would allow that off, off any designated roads. The last question is about grazing. How will grazing be handled going forward? Grazing can be an important management tool, but whose responsibility will it be to decide when and where to allow grazing? And that's coming up on a future slide. Yep, we have a, a five-year grazing lease with TCID. That was, yeah, um, one of the main comments from the 09 meetings, which we'll get into here shortly. All right, I think we're good to move on. Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, speaking of those 2009 meetings, uh, these were some of the common issues and comments that were raised at those meetings. Um, some of you on the call today may recall those, they took place back in January of 2009. Two in-person public scoping meetings were held by the department, one in Reno and another in Fallon. Um, so before you here is kind of the list of, of the um, topics that were brought up. Um, unfortunately, right after these two meetings in 09, the CMP planning process was halted um, due to delays in the transfer, uh, which Pat Kelly had mentioned earlier. So yeah, these, these are some of the topics um, that are of importance to us and to you, and, and we want to continue to hear your thoughts on how we work through some of these issues, um, like voting regulations and in hunting regulations. Uh, the last three, um, which just came up. So yeah, permits, we do have permits available. The department sells $60 annual permits and $15 daily permits. Those are in NRS. Um, we just finished up the first year of our five-year grazing agreement with TCID. So yeah, don't don't get worried when I say five years, that's the longest that any state lease can be with. So no question, these five-year leases will continue on and on and on. And uh, uh, purchasing of water rights, the department is always interested in acquiring additional water rights for this area. Um, but you know, we need willing sellers to come forward if that were to happen. The last water purchase occurred back in 2015 for the department. So um, with that, yeah, next slide. This is just you know, the next step of what this process is gonna be. And we're gonna open this back up to the public comments, but we're gonna summarize and use the comments from this scoping meeting uh, to develop a draft CMP um, with the planning team. We hope to have that available to the public um, late winter, early spring. Um, we'll see um, when we can get that out. Um, at that time, when it's released, the, you know, you'll be able to comment it, you can review it and provide additional comments again. 
after we get through that round, then yeah, then we've got you know our director's office and our wildlife commission will take a look at this too, and, and it'll be topics of discussion at future meetings. Um, we'll implement some of the strategies and, and stuff that we talked about today and stuff that's in that plan. And typically these are set up for, for 10 years of management. Um, so maybe 10 years from now, we'll be revisiting and coming up with new, new ideas and goals for the area. Um, yeah, I think we can go to the next one. And I think, yeah, Alan, take it away. Yeah, so um, again, wanted to open up the opportunity for comments on things that you would like to see considered in the management plan. Again, with the expectation, we're going to take the comments that we receive at the email address that's provided here at Carson Lake at endow.org, plus the comments that have been expressed or questions that have been expressed here in the chat and um, by the attendees. We'll take those, capture those, um, catalog them and then consider, you know, uh, actions within the management plan to identify, to address those. Um, we'll create a draft, as Mike said, with the team that we've got here today, plus other resource specialists that are more on the ground. Um, and we'll draft that. We'll host another meeting similar to this. Hopefully it's uh, live and in person. Um, but we'll, we'll host another meeting to you know, distribute that draft, um, make it available to the public for a while for people to uh, evaluate that and then host a meeting to receive comment back on it as well as written comment. Um, hopefully we're close and we only have some small tweaks to get to a final that we would then, as Mike said, take to the commission um, for ultimate approval. So. Um, again, open up the opportunity for public comment. Um, be concise and to the point. We're again trying to stick to that three-minute window and comments. Um, but you know, help us identify the strategies or concerns that you have that you would like to be considered in this uh, conceptual management plan for Carson Lake and Pasture. And then with that, we'll open up by the same process. Um, we'll start with those raising hands and then work into the chat uh, in order. And if Julie, you can track hands and track time, that would be appreciated. Yep, we've got quite a few people raising their hands. So we're going to start with Chris McKenzie. Hi, everyone. I appreciate the time you're taking to do this. Um, I will, I'll be quick. I submitted some comments. I just think it's important to remember that this uh, is it's it's a, a available because the ducks go there. And if we make it too accessible by boat or motorized vehicle or anything else, those ducks will leave. And if we can create some um, areas where there's areas for them to rest, to get the natural flow of the waterfowl, keep them around, keep them, and be inviting to new ones migrating through. I think we've kind of got a I've used the term before, turnkey operation there, and we're lucky to have it. And, you know, of course, we're all nervous about change. I think we can all work together and make this still a great place to be. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. And thank all the partners that have gotten us to this point. You know, um, it is, it's a great resource out there. And, and uh, yeah, we want to work together to maximize that potential. All right, we've got Dan Shoup next. Not sure gonna unmute. How about that? There now you you're good. <laughs> All right. I want to thank you. Great format. I'm going to go against the grain. Don't think you should have a season permit for 60 bucks a head. Uh, it's supposed to be for the public. It's the only that I'm aware of refuge in Northern Nevada that we charge that's ran by the state. Um, if you make $18,000, I don't know if you're trying to limit the amount of people. That would be my take on it. Because, But that's just me. 
Uh, when it was five bucks a head, that was one thing, but 15 bucks a head or 60 bucks a season seems a little steep. And a lot of hunters don't live in Fallon or have a place over across the street. So I'm not against at all having a place for Reno weekend hunters to go out and pull a travel trailer and park it out there somewhere. That you could charge for, but I think it ought to be allowed as opposed to going to a hotel in Fallon. That's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. All right, we've got Bob Stannard again. Sorry about that, wanted to chime back in again. I just uh, wanted to point out, Chris McKenzie had some really good points. Um, long time advocate of the Greenhead Hunting Club and, and uh, also the state of Nevada. So that's all I'm gonna say. Thank you, Bob. All right, we've got Brad Hazelbacker again. How about now? There you go. Oh, thanks. Sorry I uh, beat my drum out of turn there. I didn't know you were done with your slideshow. Back to uh, handicapped, disabled folks, access. I, I don't know that you have it out there yet. Uh, past the, the gates is the big issue because the water's so low. Spots are at a, a minimum and hiking way out there is tough for us old guys. You young folks, it's not a problem, but us guys... Uh, pushing a six, seven decade region, need a little help on that. So can we respond to that at all? Getting past those gates is a, that's a wall that's 20 feet high for a guy like me. Okay. All right, we've got Michael Goddard. Okay, I've got uh, two comments. Uh, the first is uh, I'd like to see uh, some management uh, objectives, goals, and strategies for shorebirds within the management plan, within the conceptual plan. And I'd also like to uh, see some uh, discussion about the requirements of Public Law 101-618 as far as managing the area consistent with the wizard designation. Well, thank you, and thank you for putting Bring this on today. No, thank you for your comment. All right, we've got Stanley Center. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Stanley. All right. Uh, well, thank you for hosting this meeting today. Um, I uh, just wanted to comment and thank Joe Barnes, especially for his description of the shorebird use and also wading birds, white-faced ibis and others that use the area. Uh, for shorebirds, there's, this area is unquestionably of international uh, significance. And um, I, I'm grateful that you are you know, actively calling attention to those shorebird resources. Look forward to uh, you know, looking at the draft plan and, and how that relates to management of shorebirds going forward. Many of these species are in sharp decline. And so this is an especially important time to be paying attention to, to their habitat requirements. The only specific uh, comment I'll make and then I'll uh, get off here is um, there was some mention of pond development within existing units. And I would just encourage also consideration given to active water management to provide uh, the right amounts of water at the right times and places for shorebird use. Um, and so um, uh, I, 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 I know you have some limits in your ability to move water, but I would be considering that. Uh, I guess the only other one is there's been a lot of conversation about access and uh, particularly travel maybe off the dike system. I be, want to be really careful about uh, shorebird roost sites, for example, and making sure that at the times of the year, those birds are there in numbers that uh, they're not being disturbed by um, uh, traffic just simply off the road for uh, whatever reasons. All right, thank you very much. And again, I appreciate this uh, opportunity to make some comments. Thank you for your comments. 
And we've got one more and it's Norman. Hello, Norm. You might, appears you're still on mute. There we go. Maybe we got it there. There you go. You're good. Okay. As, as most of you know, I've probably got more time working on Carson Lake and more experience with Carson Lake than maybe anybody else in the state of Nevada. And I'd like to make just one uh, request. And that would be that uh, you appoint me to be an active member of the team that's drafting this document. Um, since I've spent so much time and have uh, um, the experience and the knowledge of how that area is works. So if you could put me on as a permanent or official member of your team, I would appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Norm. So we've got lots of comments in the Q&A and in the comment box. There is one question. Okay, if it's, you want to start with the question and then we'll read the comments, I guess. Okay, you do want the comments read out loud, okay. Yeah, if you don't um, mind. Yeah, no, that's totally fine. How old do you have to be to have a gun in your truck and go hunting alone? I am going to pass that to Jake Kramer because he is best qualified to answer that question. Uh, well, let's see. If you are in a truck, you either have a driver's license to drive it, um, which would make you old enough to, to hunt because uh, it's 14 to be on your own when you're hunting. Um, if you're in that truck and you're with somebody that's an older person, then... Um, Obviously, you're in the care of, a, of an adult at that time. So um, 14 years old to hunt on your own um, with parental consent is the answer. And 16 to drive the truck. <laughs> you to drive the truck. All right. So some comments from the chat uh, from Michael Osterman. We've got I've. I'd like to see the Carson Lake WMA close during dark hours like it has been in the past. No camping. From Rose Strickland, water is critical and growing scarcer. The IAN should include conjunctive use of water among and between all the hunt and wetland areas. Uh, thank you to the opportunity to learn more about the process. Look forward to learning more about how shorebird objectives will be included in the CMP, especially in regards to active management for shorebird habitat. From Michael Osterman again, I'd like to see motorized boats allowed on all hunt days and the survey card needs to be simplified like the old Greenhead Hunt Club kill card. From Thomas Lucas, for Jacob, please think about all of us waterfowl guys who are the hands-on type when planning maintenance and repair projects. Thanks to all of you for this information. And it looks like someone just put their hand up. So this is William Malini. Hello, Willie. Are you on mute? There you go. Try that. Still not receiving any. Yeah. Audio. It looks like he's unmuted now, too.
just took down his hand. Well, I don't know how much longer we want to wait for him to figure out his sound, um, but William, you can also type uh, your comment in the chat or email it as well. Was there any other comments that we received? Maybe we could give him some time to try to tune in. Yes, we did. We just comments. got another one. From Robert, we've got the state needs to find a better way to deliver water to the Carson Lake pasture. There's always a fine balancing act of taking water too early and risk botch or take it late and run the risk of TCID shutting off the system. Yes. Willie, any chance on your microphone working? Maybe uh, we can grab Bob. Okay. And we'll come back to Willie. Yeah, just just real quick, Alan, and and I was going to direct this a little bit at Isaac. I think if we uh, concentrate on that, the and I forget what it is actually, the diversion uh, of the drain flows from the base south i know there was talk about doing that uh, i think it would really help at least us getting the drain flows that were lost after the big dig thank you thank you for that comment yeah i think there's opportunities to look at you know in that consideration of additional waters to the area i think that's a possible opportunity hello willie Last last try. Did we get a new comment? Maybe he's typing one in or we did. We just got another comment. Oh, I guess it is a question too. It's from Carl. <clears throat> How would hunting for pronghorn be handled? Will anyone with a 181 to 184 tag be able to hunt, or will there be a limited number of individuals allowed at a time? Would centerfire rifles be allowed? Will an archery hunt during that season be allowed? Blinds, question mark. Mike, do you, do you wanna try that or Jake? Um, I can take a quick stab at it. So, so uh, NAC already defines um, all wildlife management areas currently as being restricted. Uh, from rifles and pistols from being used on management areas. Um, and that's simply, simply for safety reasons um, because of the, the velocities and that, you know, how far the, how far reaching those can be. Um, deer hunting is allowed on certain areas already. Like uh, for example, Mason Valley allows deer hunting, um, but that is gonna be restricted to uh, use of shotguns and bows and arrows. So, uh, uh, I, I envision this being the same if uh, if we do allow big game hunting on this uh, on this wildlife management area it would be uh, restricted from using uh, you know centerfire rifles and, and even rimfire rifles and, and uh, handguns as well just for pure safety reasons. Mike, do you have anything else to add? No, you pretty much touched on all of it, but I think yeah, just one other thing maybe with what the question from what I heard. I think anybody that had an antelope tag for you know whatever area that falls into, um, we wouldn't restrict. You know, only one person can come out to this wildlife area and hunt antelope. I think if you had a tag in that in that area, you like Jake said, with archery and and shotgun slugs, I, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't allow hunting. But that's all part of this plan. Um, we're not sure where we're going to end up, but um, that's my thoughts. I see, thank you, thanks for that answer, Mike. Julie, can you see that uh, question and answer come in from Willie? Yes, it says, I'm on a landline phone and can hear all of you, but you can't hear me. On behalf of 
NWA, we thank you for the webinar and we will provide written comments. Thank you, Willie. And that's uh, Nevada Waterfowl Association. Do we see any other comments or any other raised hands, Julie? No, not, not this very moment. We'll give uh, a couple more seconds for some hands to pop up. Again, as identified on this slide, um, we'd love to hear your comments. Um, I thought this was really good participation that got on here today. I believe at one point we had as many as uh, 53 attendees um, and uh, really look forward to seeing your comments and your thoughts on you know, management of this property going forward. And uh, please send them to the Carson Lake at endow.org um, website, um, or you can send it to the Habitat Division at 6980 Sierra Center Parkway, Suite 120, Reno, Nevada, 89511. Um, again, the comments are due December 15th, 2021. That'll allow us to continue moving forward on getting a draft of the CMP available for public uh, review. Um, also, one point I wanted to call out is, you know, thank uh, Steve Siegel. It, it acknowledges the photos here of Steve Siegel, a retired Endow employee, but you know, um, I've had conversations with many folks relative to this property uh, coming and, and transferring from uh, federal ownership to state. And uh, I know that this has been a multi-generational effort. And I want to thank, you know, all of the past Endow employees, you know, the Greenhead Club, Audubon, you know, all the partners that have come in and assisted with getting this forward. Um, the fact that this got attention in public law and actually enabled this transfer, I wanna acknowledge everybody. And I know that by calling some out, I may have missed some, um, but there is no disrespect in that is, is that I wanna thank you all for, for all your efforts in getting this done. So um, just wanted to take that opportunity, but uh, look forward to hearing your comments. It looks like maybe we did receive one more comment, Julie. Yeah, we've got one more comment and someone with their hand up as well. All right. Let's the start. comment is, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> as far as waterfowl is concerned, resting areas are important and they need to be preserved. For instance, when there is enough water to fill Sprig Pond, a lot of waterfowl rest in the middle of it and there needs to always be restrictions for not allowing boats on Sprig Pond. And then we've got Dan Shoup. All right, Dan. That was a mistake. Thank you very much. It was a great, I thought it was a great meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you. Not seeing any more hands raised, no more comments. Nope. I see the attendance decreasing. I want to thank you all for the opportunity. Thank all the panelists, all the support of the, the resource specialists and Julie for babysitting us through this. So thanks a bunch. And we look forward to your comments. Thank you all. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, and you know, I just want to um, throw it out there, too. Please, if you supplied comments today through the chat, please send an email so that way we can keep track of everyone and we can keep everyone kind of connected on the next step. So it really helps us uh, if you can send something to that email. But yeah. Thanks, Alan, and yeah, thanks everyone for their participation.